good to see you again. I'm so excited. So now let's go ahead and get ready for our chapter two in social studies. Remember that you can follow along with the Kaplan GED Test Prep Plus 2020 book, and then you can play, pause, and rewind at any time that you want. So let's go ahead and get started with chapter two. As a reminder, we will be utilizing the Kaplan GED Test Prep Plus 2020 book for this and all videos offered through the GED on platform. You can find the links below to purchase the book at your local store or online. Remember to register your book at captest.com backslash more online for additional assistance. During this video, we will be covering Chapter 2, U.S. History, Lessons 1 to 5. Chapter 2, Lesson 1 starts on page 438. Lesson 1. Exploration, Colonialism, and the American Revolution. During this lesson, we will focus on how North America was born. In order to understand, we have to start from the beginning. Yes, I know, from the beginning, such a long time ago, but it's okay. You are going to learn very useful material in this chapter that you're going to apply to your GED test. Okay, so, and I'm with you the rest of the way. So let's start with the first Americans or Native Americans. The first Americans were individuals who traveled from Asia across the Bering Sta Strait into North America and over many generations down to South America as well. The Native Americans established many tribal cultures and several advanced civilizations in North America. They also started many inventions that we still use today, such as the irrigation system. Now, let's jump to the 1400s. In the 1400s, explorers from Europe were searching for a new sea route to take to Asia in order to expand their gold and spices trade. Their current route would take them all the way around Africa, which was super exhausting and very, very, very long. Then, in 1492 comes Christopher Columbus. He had this crazy idea that he wanted to sail across the Atlantic Ocean in order to reach the islands or the other nations much quicker. Some way or another, he convinced Spanish royalty to pay for his trip. By doing this, Christopher Columbus, he sailed and sailed and he landed in a new world. He thought at the time he was in India, so when he landed, he called the natives Indians. The resources in the world impressed several European nations. Consequently, they began their travels to the New World in hopes to find resources and conquer new lands. As a result of these events, a major shift was seen in the New World. Colonization. Colonization is the act or process of settling among and establishing control over the indigenous people of an area. So how did this affect the Native Americans? As a result of the European nations expanding in their lands, many Native Americans were killed, died from diseases, were enslaved, and forced off their lands to make way for European colonies. Colonies were a group of people of one nationality or ethnic group living in a foreign city or country in this case, the New World. In the 1500s and 1600s, the Europeans built settlements with motives of gaining power and wealth and provide colonists a permanent residence. The first English settlement emerged in Jamestown, Virginia, which led to additional settlements across the eastern part of North America. The New World was not only an inspiration for growth and glory, it was also viewed as a new home for the pilgrims. The pilgrims were a group of English people who were seeking religious freedom. In 1620, the first group of pilgrims 
sailed on the Mayflower to the New World to practice their religion. They settled in Massachusetts. In order to keep up with expansion and profit-seeking settlements in North America, the Europeans sought ways to maximize profit. Therefore, in 1675, colonists began importing a large number of slaves who had been taken from their homes in Africa. Many of them were put to work in the southern plantations. The colonies were expanding at a significant rate and with constant turmoil between nations we wanting to conquer new land, war started. In 1700, the England defeated the French in the French and Indian War. And with that, they gained control of France's colonies. These wars had taken a financial toll on England, to which in turn, they sought to recover from it by controlling additional colonies and implementing new British taxes. For example, the Quartering Act, which required Americans to provide barracks and supplies to British troops, and the Stamp Act, which was the first direct tax on the American colonies to raise money for Britain. As you can imagine, Americans were not happy with the new taxes and policies imposed on them. Another inevitable war was on the horizon. In 1775, the Continental Congress, which was a convention of delegates from the colonies who acted in their best interest, assigned George Washington to lead the Continental Army into the American Revolution. The purpose of the American Revolution was to separate from England's control and be its own nation. In addition, the Continental Congress also enacted and published the Declaration of Independence on the 4th of July in 1776, which we continue to celebrate on this day. The American Revolutionary War lasted for eight years. It was finally over when the British surrendered in Yorktown in 1781. Despite the surrendering of the British Army in 1781, there was still ongoing conflict between Great Britain and America. It was not until 1783 when the final treaty resulted in the recognition of American independence. The United States of America was born. So now what? The new nation needed to establish a government system. They created the Articles of Confederation, which was an agreement among the 13 original colonies signed in 1777. This was their first attempt to set up a new governmental system. The Articles of Confederation did not work out because it allowed the states to have a strong control over policies. It was time to reassess the government. Hence, the U.S. Constitution was born. The principles of the U.S. Constitution are based on a centralized government which ensures that not one branch of government overpowers the other one. The U.S. Constitution also gave way to the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights are the first 10 amendments to the U.S. Constitution. These are individual rights given to citizens to protect their freedoms. Some of these freedoms include freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. There was a lot of information covered in this lesson. If you need to take a break, now is a good time as it is time to move on to practice one. Practice one can be found on page 439. At this time, please pause the video and analyze the map for Practice 1, European Colonial Settlement, 1650, found on page 439, and answer questions 1 and 2. When you are ready to start, click Play. Now that we have analyzed the map, let's answer the questions. Question 1 asks, 
choose the correct phrase that will fill in the blank. Based on the map, blank had the southernmost colony in 1650. Our options are A, the Dutch, B, the English, C, the Spanish, D, the Swedish. Let's locate the southernmost colony. There it is. It looks like Spanish Florida had the southernmost colony in 1650. So if you chose C, the Spanish, you are correct. Let's move on to question two. Question two asks, which of the following conclusions is supported by the map? Our options are A, by 1650, Spain had conquered most of North America. B, the English established several colonies in the New World. C, the Dutch established their colonies in the western part of North America. D, French colonies extended along the east coast between Boston and Jamestown. If you selected B, the English established several colonies in the New World, you are correct. This is verified by noting in the map that the English had more colonies than any other country. The Spanish had only conquered the southern part of North America. The Dutch established their colonies in the East Coast and the French colonies border the northern part of North America. Now it's your turn to practice. At this time, pause the video, complete practice questions three to five, and click play when you are ready to continue. Welcome back. We are now on lesson two, Westward Expansion, the Civil War, and Reconstruction. Just like the chapter title states, we will be primarily focusing on the expansion of the United States and the hurdles this country overcame after its Civil War. The United States was rapidly expanding to the West and with expansion comes self-sufficiency. During this time, the North and the South regions of the United States sought economy growth through different industries. The North region focused on industrialization, commerce, and agriculture. While the South region was primarily agriculture, especially the harvesting and cropping of cotton. Due to the landowners' fields, they highly depended on slaves for their agriculture production. Therefore, Slavery trade also increased in exponential numbers. On the other hand, slavery was abolished in the 1800s in the North, and along with this cultural change, immigrants and women were also a contributing factor to the growth of the North region. As the United States grew, there was ongoing conflict with new territories regarding slavery. In order to address this, the United States decided that recently acquired territories would alternate on slavery, meaning that one territory would be a free state and the other a slave state. However, in the 1850s, Congress decided that they would shift the decision to the states whether they were a free or slave state. As some states were conforming with the decision, Kansas was struggling with their choice. As a result, Representatives from the North and South region fled to Kansas to help. However, it only worsened things. In an attempt to settle the disputes, the decision was put in a vote in 1855. There were discrepancies with the votes as a result of voter fraud on behalf of the pro-slavery supporters. Consequently, violence escalated between the abolitionist and pro-slavery forces which eventually spread to the entire Union. Remember that slavery was an issue in Kansas? Well, it did not stop there. In the late 1850s, political parties were torn between the issue of slavery. Then, in 1860, there were four presidential candidates and their platform was slavery. 
candidates were from the Republican, Constitutional Union Party, and Democratic Party. One of the presidential candidates was Abraham Lincoln. His platform or ideology to run for the presidency was that he promised to stop the spread of slavery but not abolish it. Although not everyone agreed with President Abraham Lincoln and his ideologies, he won the presidency. Yay! The U.S. finally had a president that would enforce policies regarding ownership of slaves. Well, that was not the case. As a result of the president's policies, most slave states seceded or withdrew from the United States and set up their own government called Confederacy. And by April of 1861, the Union and Confederacy were at war. At the start of the war, the Confederacy was showing a great amount of progress as they were winning multiple battles. In their favor, they had well-trained military leaders and soldiers that were willing to fight to keep their values and beliefs. Although they were advancing rather quickly, their rise to success would rapidly plummet. In 1863, the Confederacy lost momentum in the war. They were running short of ammunition, uniforms, and shoes because the South's economy was focused on agriculture instead of industrialization. Along with low supplies, they also faced food shortages. Since the war was fought primarily in the South, the destruction was overwhelming. Finally, in 1865, the Confederacy's army was severely wounded and was unable to continue. General Robert E. Lee conceded to Union General Ulysses S. Grant. With Lee's concession, the Civil War comes to an end. So now what? How does the United States move forward from the Civil War? This time and place is called the Reconstruction Period. Federal troops supervised while the South was rebuilding after the war. Many slaves were freed and schools were built for the children of former slaves. When the Reconstruction Period came to an end and federal troops left the South, white Americans who depended economically on slaves found a way to keep recently freed slaves in their plantation using the sharecropping system, meaning that the landlord allowed tenants or former slaves use the land in exchange for a share of the crop. This encouraged tenants to work to produce the biggest harvest that they could and ensure they would remain tied to the land and unlikely to leave for other opportunities. They also prevented African Americans from exercising the right to vote. Despite the Union's effort to uphold the Constitution's truth that all men are created equal, this was not the case after the Civil War. The Civil War ended slavery, but it did not end racism. Now that we had an overview of the westward expansion, the Civil War, and the Reconstruction period, let's take a look at Practice 2. So let's read question 1. Based on the passage on page 440, which of the following disagreements was the main case of the Civil War. A. Whether cotton should be the main crop in the South. B. Whether slavery should continue to exist. C. Whether the United States should expand westward. D. Whether slavery should be permitted in, ter in territories in the West. So let's go ahead and break this up. A. Whether cotton should be the main crop in the South. We already know <clears throat> that at the start of the Union, South was dependent on agriculture and cotton was their main crop. So there was no disagreement on that. B, whether slavery should continue to exist. That sounds like a possible answer. If you recall that in order to balance things between the North and the South, each new territory would be a free or a slave state. When Congress gave the states the ability to choose or to decide what they would be, they were having a difficult time and it started in Kansas. C. 
or whether the United States should expand westward. There was no disagreement in the expansion of the United States. So C is not the possible answer. D, whether slavery should be permitted in territories in the West. Okay, so we already know that the Congress had made a decision to allow the states to let them be a free or a slave state. So there was no disagreement as the states had agreed. So looking at all of these options, the most possible answer is B, whether slavery should continue to exist. In 1820, Missouri proposed to enter the Union as a slave state. Based on the passage, what do you think was the response of Northerners in Congress? So let's recall that new territories were inducted in pairs, meaning that one was a free state and the other one was a slave state. So with that in mind, let's look at our options. They supported having Another slave state joined the Union. They lobbied against having Missouri join the Union at all. To balance the admission of Missouri, they agreed to compromise in which Maine was admitted as a free state. And D, they started a war to prevent Missouri from attaining statehood. So based on what we already know, the correct answer is C. To balance the admission of Missouri, they agreed to a compromise in which Maine was admitted as a free state. Good job, everyone. At this time, pause the video, complete practice questions three to five, and click play when you are ready to continue. Welcome back. We are now moving on to lesson three, industrialization, immigration, and the progressive era. During this lesson, we will focus on the economical and population growth within the United States. Due to the increased population in the United States, there was an industry that grew exponentially, industrialization. Industrialization is the economic change moving from an agrarian society to an industrial one. There were three major reasons that gave way to the industrialization era. The first one was natural resources. With the westward expansion, the United States discovered many new materials that they could use for product manufacturing, such as new fuels and new metals. Secondly, as a result of these new resources, new machinery was invented to increase productivity using the resources discovered. And finally, due to the booming population that the United States was experiencing, more people were immigrating to the United States. Therefore, more product to consume was needed to keep up with demand. Industrialization gave way to several factories being built to manufacture the products consumers were yearning for. In the mid and late 1800s, factories were built in New York, Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia, and Pittsburgh. With the emergence of factories, population growth, and an increase in product and goods, manufacturing work was also increasing. In the search for better economical and labor opportunities, many immigrants came to America seeking the American dream with the belief that the United States was a nation of immigrants. The majority of the immigrants came from Germany, Italy, Russia, and Eastern Europe. However, many also came from Mexico and Central America. Immigrants from Asia was not as abundant due to laws in their country forbidding them to migrate to the United States. Despite those laws, many Japanese came to the United States and sought jobs in mining and agriculture. America's factory workers, whether native or foreign born, were working long hours in dangerous conditions. 
They had no protections from the abuse they were enduring. As a result, unions were created. The union's mission was to protect the workers and provide them with better working conditions and benefits. When an employer sought to reduce the wages, refuse a pay increase, or had unhealthy working conditions, the workers would strike. The workers left the job site and refused to work until working conditions improved. Some of the changes the labor unions brought are still seen to this day, such as overtime, minimum wage, eight-hour workday, and the five-day work week. Aside from the changes in industrialization, immigration, and workforce, there were movements to bring about social and political change. As mentioned before, unions were created to protect the workers, but there were also organizations that sought to bring change to the population in general during the progressive era. Some of the major changes that this era brought were the initiatives to clean up neighborhoods, improve health care for everyone, stop child labor, environmental awareness, and voting rights for women. Now that we have learned about the industrialization, immigration, and progressive era, let's answer some questions. Let's go to practice three. Practice three can be found on page 443. At this time, based on the passage on page 442, answer question one. Using the graphs on page 443, answer question five. When you're ready to start, click play. Let's answer question one. Which of the following likely occurs during a period of rapid industrialization? A, the annexation of new territory. B, an increase in manufacturing. C, an increase in population. D, an increase in immigration. Industrialization is related to increased manufacturing. They go together like peanut butter and jelly. Also, first two paragraphs implies that there was an increase in manufacturing. Therefore, the answer is B, an increase in manufacturing. Let's answer question five. Question five asks, which of the following best completes the statement? In the 1890s, the vast majority of persons gaining a permanent legal residency came from Europe, whereas in the early 2000s, a majority of such persons came from A, Europe and Asia, B, Asia and the Americas, C, Africa, Oceania, and Europe. If you look at the circle graph labeled 2000 to 2009, you can see that the majority of immigrants gaining legal permanent resident status came from Asia with a 34% and the Americans with a 43%. Therefore, our answer is B, Asia and the Americas. At this time, pause the video, complete practice questions 2 through 4 and 6. Click play when you are ready to continue. We are now moving on to lesson 4. The United States is an emerging world power. As the United States grew in population, they also wanted to grow the nation's economy. Businesses and government leaders wanted more natural resources they could use for their continued growing economy. They also wanted to expand trade to other nations such as Africa, Asia, and Latin America. In order to achieve their goals, they became imperialistic. Opposed to America, the European nation had been engaging in imperialism for a long time, and the United States joined in the late 1800s. 
A little after, the United States fought in the Spanish-American War. They declared war on Spain because of Spain's mistreatment of Cuba. After winning the war, the United States gained control of Cuba, Puerto Rico, the Philippines, and Guam. However, after winning the Spanish-American War, the United States only granted independence to Cuba, which led to controversial conflict and eventually to the Philippine War. But that's for another day. We still have two major wars that we need to cover. So let's move on. Remember that I told you that there were more wars? Well, let's start with World War I. The war began in Europe in 1913, and it was between two groups, the Allies and the Central Powers. The Allies included nations like Great Britain, Russia, and France. The Central Powers included nations like Germany, Austria-Hungary, in the Ottoman Empire. The war was fought for three years until the United States joined the war in 1917. The U.S. eventually joined because Germany was sinking American ships. The United States joined the Allies. The war continued on for another year and it eventually came to an end in November of 1918. The Allies had defeated the Central Powers. The destruction the war caused was unimaginable, and many thought this was the war to end all wars. However, we now know that was not true. Let's learn how the next event essentially led to World War II. World War I took a toll on the economy worldwide, especially here in the United States. This bleak period came to be called the Great Depression. The Great Depression started with the stark the stock market crashing in 1929 and leading into the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. People were no longer spending or investing in stocks. Companies were laying off their workers. The low point in the Great Depression came in 1933 when 15 million Americans were unemployed. The effects of the Great Depression were seen worldwide. In the European nation, the Depression led the way to extremist political movements such as fascism. Fascism is a form of far-right, authoritarian, ultra-nationalism characterized by dictatorial power, forcible suppression of opposition, as well as strong regimentation of society and of the economy. In other words, Fascist nations did not like democracy, and its goal is to take over other nations. So with this, we move on to the 1930s in Germany. Remember that Germany was one of the nations involved in World War I and was part of the Central Powers? And well, they lost. So they kind of had some resentment about that. In the 1930s, Germany was being led by a fascist dictator, Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler began waging war against smaller nations and conquering them. At the same time, Italy was trying to take over Ethiopia and Africa, and Japan was attacking China. Germany saw this as an opportunity to form allies with other countries to become the super nation, or the superior nation. Germany, Italy, and Japan formed a union called the Axis. The Axis's efforts to conquer and invade other nations was met by the Allies. Remember the Allies from World War I? England, France, and Russia? Well, they tried to intervene to stop the Axis. Even though the United States did not join immediately and were still dealing with the Great Depression, they turned their attention to strengthening their military infrastructure just in case they needed to step in, like in World War I. The United States finally joined the war in 1941 when the Japanese bombed a U.S. naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. Americans fought the war in Europe, Africa, and Asia. 
This war, by far, was the worst of wars. It had two atomic bombs, genocides, including the Holocaust, famine, destruction, and disease. Overall, there were tens of millions of people who died. The world finally came to an end in 1945. I apologize if this lesson was a little gloomy. It's no fun talking about the devastations that war brings. But let's go ahead and move on to practice four. Practice four can be found on page 445. At this time, you can pause. And based on the passage on page 444, answer question 2. Using the graph on page 445, answer question 3. When you are ready to start, click play. Question 2 asks, what assumption do you need to make to fully understand the last sentence in paragraph 4? on page 444. Let's read the sentence. By 1939, war again broke out between the Axis and the Allies. So let's evaluate all possibilities. A talks about the Allies fighting the Central Powers, but if you recall, this happened in World War I, not in World War II. So A is not a possible answer. B, we know for a fact that the Allies included England, France, and Russia. We can assume this because we learned this information early on in the passage. Let's keep this one as it may be a possible answer. C, we know that the Germans, Austrians, and the Ottoman Turks were part of the central powers, so we can get rid of C, and the sentence does not bring into context the central powers. D. This is new information that was provided in the paragraph. Therefore, no assumptions would need to be made. We have found our answer. B. In World War II, the Allies included England, France, and Russia. We could assume that this is true because we learned it when we were reading about World War I. Let's answer question three. Franklin D. Roosevelt became president during the height of the Great Depression in 1933. He soon instituted a set of federal programs called the New Deal to try to lower unemployment, which conclusion about the effectiveness of New Deal programs does the text on page 444 and graph below support. The graph shows a decline in the unemployment rate after the New Deal went into effect in 1934. It shows that unemployment went up in 1938 but then dropped after that and dropped considerably after the United States entered into World War II in 1941. So knowing that, Let's look at our options. A. Within a year, the New Deal had raised unemployment to its pre-depression level. We know that's not true. B. Within a year, the New Deal had lowered unemployment to its pre-depression level. That is not true either. C. Unemployment fell after the start of the New Deal and continued to fall sharply as the United States entered World War II. Sounds about right, but let's look at D just in case. The New Deal lowered unemployment, but Allied victory in World War II lowered it further. It seems that we have found our answer. C. Unemployment fell after the start of the New Deal and continued to fall sharply as the United States entered World War II. At this time, Pause the video, complete practice questions one and four, and click play when you are ready to continue.
We are almost done. We are now moving on to lesson five, the Cold War and Civil Rights Era. Lesson five, the Cold War and Civil Rights Era. I know, another war. Don't worry, this one is not like the other ones. After World War II, there was ongoing conflict between capitalist and communist nations. Leading the capitalists was the United States and the communists was the Soviet Union, two superpowers, kind of like Batman and Superman. The Cold War was named Cold War because these two nations never engage in combat, unlike Superman and Batman, in Batman vs. Superman, but that's not relevant to this conversation. So let's move on. Even though they did not fight each other, there were smaller physical conflicts. These included the Korean War and the Vietnam War. America sent several soldiers and ammunition to help South Vietnam fight against the communist North Vietnam. Despite the ongoing effort to win the Vietnam War, the Americans and Vietnamese soldiers kept losing. In 1973, America decided to leave Vietnam. However, the war continued until North Communist Vietnam won the war. The Vietnam War caused a separation between Americans because some believed that America should have not been involved in the war and others believe that they should have not left Vietnam prior to the war ending. Even today, people still have strong emotions about the Vietnam War, either positive or negative. Okay, so the Vietnam War ended, but the Cold War was still going on. In the 1980s, the Soviet leader Mikhail Gorbachev tried unsuccessfully to reform communist government. This led to the collapse of many communist unions in the Eastern Europe and the tearing down of the Berlin Wall, which at one point separated East and West Germany. As a result, the Soviet Union started disintegrated and in 1991, the Cold War and communism ended. Communism was no longer seen as a political threat. I think we're done with wars. Let's move on to another important part of US history, the civil rights movement. Remember that slavery was abolished, but racism continued? Well, this is what they meant. After the Civil War, there was immense discrimination against the black American community, especially in the South. There were a series of Jim Crow laws that stated that black Americans were not allowed to use the same public facilities as whites, live in towns with white people, and marry interracially. These laws were not in effect in the North. However, black Americans still experience discrimination when they try to buy a home or obtain a higher education. There were also laws that limited their voting rights. But mid 20th century, black Americans fought for equality the civil rights movement was led by many, by many prominent community members, one of which is Martin Luther King Jr. Some of the victories during the civil rights movement were integrated public facilities, schools, fair housing, protecting voting rights of minorities, and preventing discrimination based on race or cultural background. The struggle continues today where minorities want the laws that went into effect during the civil rights movement to be upheld. Another change that we have seen in the most recent years has been that of technology. Technology has helped us advance in science, medicine, and our own personal lives. Computers and smartphones, a couple of examples that have helped revolutionize the United States. Computers allows us to produce twice the amount of work and cell phones provide us the ability to communicate with our friends and family around the world within minutes, if not seconds. Technology has provided us with, with many benefits, but it has also caused additional problems, such as polluting the air with exhaust from an increase in car production, 
polluting the water with acid rain as a result from burning coal to generate electricity and polluting our land with trash and hazardous waste. Let's move on to answer questions. Practice five can be found on page 447. At this time, pause the video and based on the passage on page 446, answer questions one and three. When you are ready to start, click play. Let's answer question one in practice five. The conflict during the second half of the 20th century between the United States and the Soviet Union was called the Cold War because it involved blank. In 1991, the blank finally brought the Cold War to an end. This is a two-part question, so let's focus on the first part. The conflict during the second half of the 20th century between the United States and the Soviet Union was called the Cold War because it involved blank. If you recall, early on during this lesson, we talked about why it was called the Cold War. It was called the Cold War because there was never really any direct combat between the United States and the Soviet Union. There were smaller wars, such as the Vietnam War, um, but there was really never any direct combat between the United States and Soviet Union. So we can safely assume that our answer is D no direct combat. Let's look at the second part. In 1991, the blank finally brought the Cold War to an end. So let's go ahead and look at our options and then we can find our answer. Our options are A, destruction of the Berlin Wall, B, dissolution of the Soviet Union, C, separation of the East and West Germany, D, death of Mikhail Gorbachev. Okay, so there were some events prior to the Soviet's dissolution, such as the Berlin Wall, which separated the East and West Germany, and the unsuccessful efforts of Mikhail Gorbachev to reform communism. However, it doesn't say anything about his death ending the Cold War. The only other option that we see is B, the dissolution of the Soviet Union, because remember, once that happened, the Cold War ended. Therefore, our answer is B, the dissolution of the Soviet Union. Let's answer question three. Which of the following statements about the Vietnam War is a false generalization? A. Some Americans served in both Korea and Vietnam. B. The United States sent massive military aid to South Vietnam. C. Americans were in complete agreement about pulling out of Vietnam. D. The Vietnam War lasted much longer than the Korean War. Okay, so it seems that A, B, and D can be looked on as facts, not an opinion, and it's not a generalization. C, Americans were in complete agreement about pulling out of Vietnam. Remember, based on the passage, it states that the Vietnam War was one of the wars that divided many Americans. So therefore, our answer is C, Americans were in complete agreement about pulling out of Vietnam. At this time, pause the video, complete practice questions two, four, and five, and click play when you are ready to continue. Congratulations, you made it. We are now moving on to unit three, social studies, chapter three, civics and government. 
I'll see you soon.